So we want to talk about how to write off almost anything. I want to give you a little bit of my background to give you an understanding of who I am as a person, why I do what it is that I do, and I am licensed as an inroad agent. I am licensed through the U.S. Treasury Department. I am licensed in all 50 states to prepare tax returns to represent you before the IRS. I also teach accounting, so I understand all the nuances as it pertains to pulling together your numbers for your tax returns. I'm a professor at um, a University of Cal State Dominguez Hills. I own my own tax practice. I have my master's in tax law. I eat and sleep income taxes. It is my zen. I know a lot of you may think that is the weirdest thing on the planet but I read the tax code for fun. So when it comes to the tax code, that I know like the back of my hand. So my goal today is to really teach you as self-employed individuals how to really save money on your taxes, how to do it legally, and how to keep Uncle Sam off of your back. Does that sound like an agreement? Yeah. All right, so let's move forward. As you know, there are two types of taxpayers my clicker's not working, so which way am I going with that? There's typically two groups of taxpayers that I see in my practice. Um, and the two groups of taxpayers, usually I get people walking in that are ultra aggressive taxpayers. They're like, Carla, I just want to write off everything. They're writing off the kitchen sink. They're writing off everything that you can imagine. Those are the type of people that we want to avoid. We don't want to just be aggressive taxpayers. We want to be taxpayers that write off things within the code, within the law. And the code has 80,000 some pages to it. It was modified at the end of December 2015. We got an extender bill, and it's going to be modified again as we're in a political year. It's going to change. It's not your job to understand it. It's my job to read it and bring you that information. So I just want you to know, we don't want to be that ultra-aggressive taxpayer. But by the same token, we don't want to be the conservative taxpayer. I don't want you to say to me, you know what, Carla, I don't want to write off this write-off because I'm concerned about what Uncle Sam is going to do. I don't want to be audited. I don't want Uncle Sam knocking on my door. I just want you to know if Uncle Sam is going to knock on your door, he's going to knock on your door. There's very little you can do about that because audits are typically random and they're very selective. And unfortunately, we're in a real estate market that IRS goes after the real estate market. Because of the big fiasco we had when the market all went crazy a few years ago, the mortgage industry, IRS has targeted the real estate industry as an industry to go after. So just know that you are in that pool of people. With that being said, we don't want to be afraid of our write-offs. Because if Uncle Sam knocks on your door and says that you're being audited, and if he finds one extra dollar of income, you're going to have to report that one extra dollar of income. But by the same token, I want you to be able to take all of your write-offs because you are entitled to them. So there is one thing that I want you to walk away from this room knowing that there is a publication called the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. That is publication number one. You need to know that there is a Taxpayer Bill of Rights because if Uncle Sam knocks on your door, and that's what they do now, they knock on your door, they send you these nasty letters, they also have a scam going right now where people are calling harassing people. I want you to know as a taxpayer, you don't have the right to talk to IRS. You do not have to talk to them. It's not confessional. You're not before your priest. You don't have to tell them everything that you know. You have the right to remain silent. And that's very important for you to know that. Because a lot of times people think that if I get contacted by Internal Revenue Service, I just need to automatically start talking. So I want you to know you do have the right to representation. Are you guys with me on that? And it is better that you get somebody to represent you because sometimes what we say very innocently to Internal Revenue Service turns into a nightmare and an audit. And let me give you an example of that. So I had a situation where a taxpayer was being audited. The IRS called their place of business, because they're self-employed like you guys are. The IRS called their place of business. We had the super assistant that we all trained to answer questions for us, right? Answer those questions, field our phone calls, only transfer me who I really need to talk to.
So the super assistant answers the phone, it's the IRS, and the IRS says, oh, is Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so in? And she goes, no, they're not available. How may I help you? Oh, I was just kind of concerned about their write-offs on their tax return. Do they own two vehicles? Oh, yeah, they do own two vehicles. What even vehicle do you want to know about? So the super assistant starts giving away all of this information. There's nothing illegal about the assistant giving the information if they volunteer that information. So we want to be very careful in who represents us before the IRS. Are you guys with me on that? Okay, very good. So we don't want to be an aggressive taxpayer. We don't want to be a conservative taxpayer. We want to be a taxpayer that uses the code to the fullest extent. Are you guys with me on that? Being that you are self-employed, I am going to tell you that you are sitting on a gold mine of write-offs. The tax code is really for two people. It's for wage earners and it is for the self-employed people. The people that are making all the rules in Congress, are those people wage earners or are they self-employed? Self-employed. Self the Donald Trumps of the world are self-employed. All of those people that are running for office, those people are self-employed. Those are the people that are making the rules. So do you think the rules are going to be in favor of the self-employed or the W-2 people? The self-employed people. How many of you in here are self-employed? All right. So the rules are for you. So that's what we want to talk about. We want to talk about how to use the rules for the self-employed. Now, does it matter how much money you make? in order to use those rules? Absolutely not. The rules are available whether you make 50,000 or 50 million thousand. The difference is the, the people that make a lot of money hire the really sophisticated people to help them avoid paying taxes. Are they doing that legally or illegally? Legally. They're doing it legally. Why are they doing it legally? Because they, the right they hire the right people and they use what? They use a tax code. So we got to learn how to use the tax code as individuals. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about, how to use a tax code to the fullest extent, because it's legal and that's what you should do. I personally enjoy being audited. My husband is sitting here today with me. He doesn't like it, but I love it. And the reason why I love it is because I love a challenge with the Internal Revenue Service. If you're going to audit me, you're going to best believe that when we walk away from that audit, you're, you're going to pay me back money. That is my goal. So when you're audited, it's not just about IRS going, you are a bad person. You can also bring other things to the table. So I want to tell you the things that you need to be aware of so that you can protect yourself and be ready to go. So the very first thing that you need to do, and there's four things, in order for you to use a tax code to the fullest extent is to have a business. How many of you in here have a business? How many of you are self-employed as realtors? How many of you have a business? That should be the entire rule. room. If you have a realtor license, you have a business. That's the first thing you need to know. Whether you believe it or not, you are have a business. If you're receiving a 1099, you have a business. So you need to conduct yourself as though you have a business. That's rule number one. So whether you're on a Schedule C, whether you've incorporated yourself because you're a broker, you are a business owner. That's the first thing I want you to understand. You need to have a business. That's the first step. Once you have a business, and I'm ready to jump to my next slide, you need to make sure that every expense you have has a business purpose. So what does the law say in order to write off your business expenses? This is literally what the law says under Code Section 162. The law says that you, in order for you to take a business deduction, it has to be ordinary, it has to be necessary. And there you go. Who said that? <laughs> and fun. Because the funner the expense, the bigger the write-off. I totally agree with that. It has to be ordinary, necessary, and fun. Who defines ordinary and necessary? No. We define ordinary and necessary. We define it. So if I can link ordinary and necessary to my business, to my expense, to generating income, it becomes a write-off for me.
Let me tell you about a client that I represented. I didn't prepare the tax return, but this particular client was a realtor down in, um, I want to say Dana Point, Laguna Niguel, one of those high-end areas, and she and her husband purchased a yacht. A yacht, yeah, I see the expression on your face. I said, yacht, I said, take me out on that yacht and I'll get you a tax deduction for it. <laughs> she purchased a yacht. When she was audited, IRS disallowed that yacht, okay? And a yacht is a lot of money. Once we represented her, we got that, lot, that yacht allowed. Why do you think we were able to do that? It was a business expense. Why was it a business expense? <laughs> All her contracts are signed on the lot. I like that. The reason why we got it as a business expense is because she used it as a marketing tool. She was selling high-end houses. She would take people out on tours. She would do presentations. Did she have fun on her yacht? Absolutely. Did she take people out on her yacht? Absolutely. Did I go out on her yacht? You better believe it. Did we get a tax write-off? Absolutely. And we got that yacht written off 100% because I was able to link it was ordinary and necessary to the clientele that she was trying to secure in Dana Point and Laguna, people that live near the beach that have this type of lifestyle. Are you guys with me on that? Yes. So you define ordinary and necessary, not the IRS. The IRS doesn't define that. We go by the law, the code. A lot of times, if you're in an audit, IRS doesn't even pull out the code. They pull out their little publications that don't mean a hill of beans. The code trumps that because that's the law. So I said you have to have two things. The first thing is the business. The second thing I said that you have to have a business purpose. Does that make sense? Yes. Let's move to our third thing. Proof of payments. We want to make sure that we are keeping our documentation. A lot of things that we're doing now, we're doing on the internet. We are buying things off of Amazon. We're doing a lot of PayPal payments. We're getting those receipts. Those receipts are going in our emails. And we're going to repool those receipts later when we get audited, right? Yeah. And then what happens? The computer crash, the technology goes down, and we don't have the receipts. Rule number three, take the time to print your receipts, take the time to secure your documentation. We have a proprietary program called BOSS, Back Office Support System, where it allows you to take pictures of your receipts and store them in my vault on my server. It is very, very important that you get your receipts now. Because if you get audited, we have 10 days to present documentation. We need the receipt. We need the method of payment by check or credit card. We need both. The credit card statement is no longer enough. You know how you get your American Express statements or your Capital One statements that show all of your transactions? That's great, but we need the physical receipts. Unfortunately, IRS is still in the old age. Excuse me if there's any agents in here, but I speak truth. IRS is still in the old age, and we have to have those physical receipts. So we need method of payment, we need receipts. Are you guys with me on that? Yeah. Please make sure you do that. That's the third thing that you need to have. The fourth thing that you need to have is to make, sense, make sure that you properly put the expenses on the correct place on the tax return. Now, I'm just going to tell you, I've been doing taxes for 24 years. I know I'm only 25. I was one of those prodigy kids. I started when I was one. I've been doing it for 24 years. I have seen some very atrocious tax returns come through my office. A lot of these audits that you get into are because the people that are preparing the tax returns do not put things in the proper categories. That is a problem. You want to make sure that things are being put in the proper categories and they make sense. So let me give you some examples of things that don't make sense. Wells Fargo credit card expense that is on your tax return. That doesn't make sense. Bad debt because somebody didn't pay you. That does not make sense. My kids books for school. I've seen that literally written out on a tax return. 
that does not make sense. You have to use the proper categories because it's like anything else. My four sons play football. Praise God for my husband who keeps them going. I have two on football scholarships right now, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. They play football. And one of the things that I say, if you're going to go to the football team, the football game, you're going to come dressed in a football uniform. You're not coming in the basketball outfit with the basketball tennis shoes or cleats. I'm still not sure. You're not coming with that, right? You're coming with the helmet. You're coming with the gear, the shoulder pads. You want to come look like you're ready to play the game. So if you want to prevent from sticking out before the IRS, make sure when you file your tax return that it follows the proper format. Don't put things on your tax return that are going to trigger an audit. I have another case that I'm working right now, a doctor um, client who also is a real estate investor. He had this gentleman prepare his tax return, and I don't know if the person prepared the tax return on April 15th, if he prepared the tax return after he had a bottle of wine. I don't know exactly what transpired. But when I looked at this tax return, I can see why the taxpayer was audited. The client currently owes back 273000 because the IRS has gone back five years on him. I'm going back and I'm cleaning that up because the categories that the taxpayer used are not correct categories. That triggered the audit. So we don't want to trigger audits by not doing what we're supposed to do on a basic level. We want our tax returns to go in under the radar. We want it to all be nice and neat. We want it to go in by April 15th. The, the theory about file your tax return on extension and you won't get an audit is a big theory and it's bogus. File your tax return with the masses so you can avoid that trigger. Are you guys with me on that? File your tax return on time. If for some reason you cannot pay the balance due on the tax return, still file the tax return on time. Because the penalty for failing to file on time and not paying on time is 25%. File on time, don't pay on time, it's 5%. So don't give yourself that 20% hit because you can't pay on time and can't file on time. If you can't pay on time, you really need to file on time. Are you guys with me on that? Okay, very good. So who can tell me the four things I said we needed to make sure that we file a good tax return with the proper documentation using the proper code? Anybody? Run your business like a business? Your business expenses must be make perfect sense. What else? Write categories. What else? File on time. Use the proper receipts. Use the proper categories. Very, very important. Don't be an ultra aggressive taxpayer. Don't be a conservative taxpayer. Be a taxpayer that files within the code, within the law. Hit an IRS agent with the law, and they will start shaking in their boots. When I go to an audit, which I love going to audits, by the way. It is my zen. I love nothing more than representing a client in the audit. When I go to an audit and an IRS starts telling me things, the first thing I say to them, I let them talk, and then I say, can you show me the law on that? And then they look at me like I got two heads, because a lot of times they don't even know the law. So just be aware of that, okay? All right, so let's keep going. Common nuances, you want to have proper record keeping, you want to have organized records, and you want to do, I'm going to skip these couple of slides. The other thing that you want to make sure you do, you want to make sure that you tax plan. I'm going to close it up with these last five things. Here's the key. You want to have conversations with your tax person throughout the year. If you're just seeing your tax person from January through April 15th, it is like going to the emergency room and you're bleeding. And whichever emergency room doctor you get, you get. You want to make sure that you're having a relationship with your tax person all year long and that you're doing tax planning. My clients are meeting with me all year, a minimum of four times a year. We're planning out their taxes. We're planning to minimize their taxes. They're not concerned about whether they're going to owe or not because they already know. And we've gotten it down to the lowest legal limit possible. 
Tax season now is compliance season. We're just filing the tax returns. So I'm going to tell you a couple of other things. I'm going to open it up for questions. I'm going to wrap it up. Number one, you need to like your tax person. If you're not going to invite your tax person to Thanksgiving dinner or give them a slice of pumpkin pie, they're not your person. They need to be up close and personal with you. You need to be able to talk to them and tell them your most intimate secrets. I want my clients to bring pumpkin pie. It's my favorite. I warm it up in a microwave, a little whipped cream. I'm good. Those are the type of people you want to deal with. They need to be your trusted advisor. You want to be able to talk to them. You want to be able to tell them your goals and objectives because it's not just about what you put on your tax return today. It's about your end game later on, what your ultimate goals are. If you're building your real estate portfolio, what is your ultimate goal to retire? If you're a realtor, how do you want to save your money streamline so that you can build wealth later on? It's a lot that goes into it. I can talk forever. I'm Carla Dennis. I am a tax girl at heart. I love pumpkin pie. I'm going to open it up for whatever questions you have.